Okay, then if you could throw the agenda up, Brian, please. Thank you. All right, can you see the agenda? Yep, Commissioner Weaver, whenever you are ready. Okay, I will call to order the April 26, 2021 uh, WPC meeting. We will start with approval of agenda and the meeting minutes. Um, do we have any changes to the agenda? Yes, commissioners, I do apologize. I'd like to request removal of item 6C. Uh, it was a placeholder uh, originally and the specific tax projects are actually listed further in the agenda. All right, thank you. Do we have a motion to adjust the agenda as suggested? This is Commissioner Shea, I'll make a motion to adjust the admission, adjust it as we discussed. And do we have a second? Commissioner Pant will second that. Thank you. All right, I will do roll. Commissioner Weaver. Aye. Commissioner Thill. Aye. Commissioner Shea. Aye. Commissioner Veerling. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. Thanks. And Commissioner Pint. Yes, aye. This passed. Uh, let's move on to the meeting minutes. Uh, do we have any suggested changes to the minutes from last month or a motion to approve the minutes as presented? Commissioner Beerling, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. We have a second. Commissioner Casilius will second the motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Thank you. All right, I'll do roll. Commissioner Weaver. Aye. Commissioner Thill. Aye. Commissioner Shea. Aye. Commissioner Veerling. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. And Commissioner Pint. Aye. It's fast. Uh, we have a public comment letter that I believe Vanessa is going to read through for us. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to remind the commissioners, because we are currently um, due to COVID uh, and the closing of the building, uh, all of our meetings are being held virtually. So our public comment process is to reach out to staff and submit in advance. And then after the meeting, staff will reach back out to the resident. Now the resident is always invited and has been invited to listen in and, and to the meeting or watch it obviously afterwards as it'll be posted on our YouTube video. So at this time, I'm gonna to read to you a letter that was received by one of our residents, Maxine Hughes. Maxine is somebody we're familiar with and she's a wonderful resident. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and read this for you on her behalf. Good morning, County Board members. My name is Maxine Hughes. I live at 1259 Maxine Circle East, Shakopee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of water quality in our county lakes and inform you of the current wake boat issues. I am a Shakopee resident and business owner. I grew up on a farm with fields on the shores of O'Dowd Lake. Three years ago, my husband and I returned to live on the lake. Currently, I'm a member of the O'Dowd Chain of Lakes Association and serve as a lake monitor for both the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Met Council Environmental Services, the CLMP program and our camp program, I'm measuring water quality and collecting water samples. I've observed many changes to the lake over the years, where once farms surrounded by the lake, now large residential lots, a DNR boat launch, a city park with fishing pier and Stonebrook golf course line the shores. Despite the development, O'Dowd is one of the cleanest lakes in Scott County. Last year, the lake was busier than ever. Due to the COVID restrictions, people flocked to lakes throughout the state. In addition, like other communities in Scott County, Shakopee is growing and many residents are finding and enjoying O'Dowd's attractions, clean water, good fishing, and nature. The biggest challenge and the biggest change, sorry, last summer was the presence of wake boats. 
These powerful boats move slower than conventional ski boats, churning water so boarders ride the waves without ropes, but also creating wake action that detracts from others' enjoyment. I observed kayaks, canoes, paddle boarders, and fishing boats disturbed by the wakes the boats create. Waves generated by these boats even disturb large pontoon boats. Waves have flown over the pontoons on my boat and onto the deck. Last 4th of July, 16 pontoon boats were huddled in one corner of the lake after several wake boats took over the main body of the lake. These wake boats are too powerful for these shallow and fairly small lakes. O'Dowd is less than 300 acres and 22 feet at its deepest. People enjoy fishing these lakes and the deep waves disturb the aquatic vegetation and lake bottoms. The public fishing pier located in the main body of the lake area is where the wake boats circle. I'm sure the noise and wave compromises the fishing experience. As a monitor, I observed a marked decrease in water clarity over the course of last season. I spotted fewer herons and a loon that made its home on the lake for the past several years left the lake. Many studies confirm what I have seen and am reporting. They focus on the ecological impacts caused by the large waves created by these boats, including shore and bank erosion, decreased water clarity, water quality degradation, and harm to aquatic plant and animal species. Shallow waters experience the most direct impact of boat wakes. The University of Minnesota is currently studying the impacts of boat generated wakes as part of the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory Healthy Waters Initiative, a University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center study showed that the large volume of water holding ballast tanks awake boats provided mussels and algae the greatest opportunity for interlake transport. These boats are not designed to fully drain all ballast tank water. Scott County invests resources and expertise to help landowners and public entities stabilize lake shores and improve water quality. Wake boats compromise the progress we have made in this area because they destroy shoreline, disrupt vegetation, decrease water clarity, and disturb recreational activities. Many of Scott County's 25 lakes are shallow. They are very vulnerable to this disruption. I ask you to give this issue careful study. I encourage you to support House Resolution 1606 wake surfing regulated on MN waters and consider what steps our county can take towards solving the problem that wake boats create. Maybe even considering banning wake boats in Scott County. Thank you so much for your time and attention and thank you for the work that you do to keep our county safe and healthy. I have left my email address for you if you would like to contact me for more information or have questions. You, Vanessa, um, and I understand that this was sent to the county board, but they directed it to us to take a look at, correct? That is correct. It would be uh, appropriate for that to be the process. Um, could, are there any questions for the commissioners? Yeah, this is Commissioner Pint. The first question I have is I'm not familiar with House Resolution 1606, what the status of it is or what the content of it is. Does anybody on staff have any information on that? I, I have read it, um, but I haven't stayed on top of it. Uh, typically with public comment, um, we would take it in and then if the commissioners chose, you could certainly direct staff to look into a specific issue and bring it back to you for consideration. Uh, that's Commissioner Penn, follow up question then. Um, it, it seems to me that um, wake restrictions and, and, and size of motor restrictions, et cetera, typically come from the DNR, um, unless I'm mistaken. So the first question I have then is, you know, this resolution to see where this is at. Second of all, what the DNR's position is, you know, I don't know if we would have the authority to in any way, you know, mandate that there's no wake uh, voting on this particular lake. Staff's comments would appreciate it. Absolutely, Commissioner Pitt. Those are both great comments. Uh, we can certainly look into what the DNR's current position is. Um, I can I can bring more information to you back on what the county's 
uh, capacity is to address boat, uh, wake boats specifically. Uh, counties do have authority to pass uh, resolutions regarding um, wake in lakes, not necessarily specific vehicles, but uh, for example, we have lakes that have no wake restrictions or low wake restrictions. So counties do have that authority. However, a lot of that enforcement is still to the sheriff's office. And um, obviously uh, you probably need uh, the DNR and um, similar agencies to kind of support or concur with that. Oh, thanks. And the final comment that I'll make then is, is I would be very interested in getting more information on this, finding out, like I said, what this uh, resolution is, the status of it is, et cetera. And then uh, after a little more research, um, putting on an agenda in a future month, uh, we could then potentially make a recommendation to, to recommend um, that we either support this House bill or talk to, you know, petition the DNR or potentially even at the county level uh, once we have more information. Staff would be happy to do that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the commissioners? This is Commissioner Casilius, and I would agree with the, the, the um, commissioner, I think it was Commissioner Pint, I believe. Um, I live on Cedar Lake and we have had similar issues over the past summer and I anticipate we probably will again. And our lake is actually even more shallow than O'Dowd. So, um, if we can learn more, I think that would be great. Um, I, I also agree that I think enforcing rules like that are challenging, but I, I, I certainly think it's worth learning more about. I can certainly do that. Uh, one other recommendation I might make is uh, we don't currently have any data that reflects the impacts of wave boats or wake boats on O'Dowd or our other lakes. So while we do monitor for many different parameters, that is not one that we have focused on. So if it is an issue that the commissioners are curious or concerned about, uh, I might suggest staff spend a little bit more time each year uh, tracking that data um, because we don't, we don't have it. So we don't know whether or not um, wave boats will have a long-term impact on these lakes. One year of data, um, doesn't really reflect an actual change in trends or lake health. So that might be one other direction you might consider going as well. Yeah, I was actually gonna ask and see if there was a way we could start looking at that. Um, do you have any ideas about that right now? I mean, can we track erosion or anything and actually attribute it to, to wake boats or is it, um, I'm not sure what you could attract or excuse me, what you could track that you could necessarily say we're from the wake boats versus other climate or things like yeah, that. So, well, we could definitely, you're right. Some of it is a little difficult. We're not going to necessarily go and tag every wake boat that's out there or every wave boat. Um, however, if there's a market use increase in um, wave boat usage or bays where there's a higher amount of, of wave boat action, um, we can do a little bit more additional water uh, clarity monitoring or water quality monitoring for transparency, for example, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I will turn that actually over to Melissa to look into and bring back to the commissioners for potential options. Uh, but right now we don't even have any trends for the lakes that indicate there's an impact. So uh, even just general trends following our standard monitoring aren't reflecting it. So that would definitely be a good spot to start. Yeah. Other questions or comments from the commissioners? Yeah, this Commissioner Pan, one follow-up then. So Melissa, if you're gonna kind of spearhead this, um, I'm not discouraging you from trying to come up with any kind of measurements on Pacific Middle Dow, but perhaps maybe more beneficial would be see if you can find any research that's been done on other lakes as to have they been able to prove uh, wake board damage to certain lakes, et cetera. So if there's any other studies out there, we'd appreciate seeing that data. Thank you, Commissioner Penn, I will, I will do that. Hey, Vanessa. Uh, Bruce yes. Loney, Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District. Yes, Mr. Um, Loney, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, 
the city of Chanhassen just went through this issue on Lake Lotus in the city of Chanhassen. That might be a good resource to check in. And I believe what they ended up doing is lowering the lake level where it's a no wake. So you might want to look into that, how they handle it. That was very contentious and a lot of public meetings on that. So just FYI. Thank you, that was very helpful. All right, any other comments or questions? Okay, we look forward to hearing uh, what you come up with. Um, next, staff reports. Looks like we have Troy up. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, commissioners. So I'll just briefly uh, hit some highlights from the report and then I will uh, stand by for any questions following that. So we're currently with our technical assistance and cost share program have about 220 active uh, cases. We're working with landowners on their conservation projects or issues. About three quarters of the 220 is uh, in, within the WMO. Um, and we roughly have probably a hundred and 70 or, or 120 to 130 or so of that caseload actually are projects that are in various levels of planning or, or completion. So, so we, we continue to uh, maintain a fairly heavy workload. Um, it's been about this point, or as you can see from the graph steady since last November, we're hovering right around the same numbers in terms of uh, that, that workload. Our soil health cover crop initiative, we continue to implement our five-year strategic plan. The latest uh, initiative of that has been to really go out and uh, promote the cover crops and the grant funding we have available. We have a number of grant funds that uh, provide a source of funding to provide incentives for cover crop. And we so we're really hitting, hitting that hard where we have a, um, countywide mailer we did to all our ag producers. And then we're also going to do some one-on-one -on -one meetings or follow-ups with calls uh, and just continue uh, knocking on doors and, and promoting that practice. Um, clean water education program. So we haven't met uh, since February, but since then we had our uh, SQUEP partnership meeting. Uh, that was earlier in February. Uh, and we're putting the final touches on our 21, 2021 annual report, our work plan, and finishing up the 2020 report as well. We held our uh, annual rain garden webinar. Uh, that was April 7th. We've um, created a home a per, uh, homeowner chloride pollution kit. Uh, that's part of the watershed based implementation funding grant to promote uh, chloride uh, awareness and action. We're also doing something similar with uh, bacteria. Uh, those two go hand in hand in terms of the grant project that we're working on. So we're just a pet waste outreach as well. An inventory assessment, we're continuing to work on the Roberts Creek subwatershed assessment where we are assessing uh, using a, a model called PTM app, which is prioritize target and measure. Uh, we use that model to identify areas throughout this Roberts Creek watershed uh, where we have the potential to install BMPs or app practices. And we would eventually have a, a list of sites along with the type, practice type and pollution reduction estimates and cost benefits. Uh, it should be a fairly substantial size list given the size of the watershed, but we anticipate having that done sometime mid-year. I'll skip over zoning and livestock, move on to water quality. Uh, in the Scott WMO, we're working on um, where we're doing uh, water quality monitoring on two creeks this, this uh, season. One is the Roberts Creek and the other is Pika. So we got the equipment set up and working with the watershed staff um, and actually did our first round of monitoring recently on both of those water bodies. Uh, buffer law, we have no activity. Uh, any issues we had with respect to a couple of non potential non-compliance are, are being resolved or have been resolved. 
uh, so we continue with a good compliance with that program. Uh, you'll recall me announcing back in January, perhaps, that uh, our tree program had got off to a gangbuster start, and honestly, it, it never stopped. So we're up to about 35,000 trees sold. We're just about sold off out of every tree at this point. And um, actually, this week, we're, we're bundling all the orders, and Friday is our distribution day. So we'll be handing out about 35,000 trees, as I said, plus... Uh, compost bins, uh, rain barrels, and uh, uh, many, many orders of uh, native seed mixes. After, after uh, this week, then we're gonna open up our, our tree program website. We'll turn, turn it over from selling trees to over to native plants, and we'll send, uh, be selling native plant kits. Many of those are used for pollinator gardens and rain gardens, so, um, so that'll be next. Cooperative Weeded Management, we were awarded a 2021 grant from the MDA. Typically that grant's 5,000, but due to program cuts and just more demand for the program, uh, it was only 2,000 this year, but it'll help us continue our successful endeavor to control the spread of wild parsnip throughout the county, which we've had great success with so far. Uh, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll I'll uh, just wind it up by going to the last page of the report, uh, just showing you those are all the um, cooperative payments we made for our cost share program. Uh, there was over $53,499 worth of payments issued for projects within the WMO and new applications. Uh, we have about a little over $16,000 new applications. And again, this was from March and April, uh, seeing as we didn't uh, meet in March. Uh, I compiled both months together in this report. With that, I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Troy. Any questions from the commissioners? All right, hearing none, we can move on to the Scott WMO update from Vanessa. You're on mute, you mute Vanessa. I haven't done that in a while. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a handful of updates that just uh, aren't being covered by Melissa or Ryan during their program updates. Uh, so I'm going to start out with the move. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, the staff in the Government Center East building, so that's the original Government Center building, uh, have moved out officially by uh, the first week of April uh, and took a couple more weeks to get everything out. Uh, but we have now officially moved out of the old government building. Uh, we do have two temporary workstations in the new government center west building um, up on the second floor. Uh, it's, it is a lovely, lovely building. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, if you ever have a chance to, to stop in once it's open, I definitely recommend it if you have a need. Uh, so we do have a couple of temporary workstations that we kind of are sharing for staff to help keep uh, the costs down. Since so much of the work that we do is uh, either field, site, or collaborative based as it is, uh, there's not a strong need to necessarily be in the office. So we're going to continue to telework for the remainder of the year. Uh, the board has now moved to virtual meetings as well, uh, primarily because, again, as part of the cleaning out and clearing out of the East Government Center building for rehab, the um, boardroom is no longer available in order to be rehabbed. So <laughs> all meetings are virtual for the long, um, for at the moment. Um, in addition to that, there is a bit of uh, construction work going on as well in the parking areas. Uh, so for the month of May, obviously, unless staff really needed to be in the buildings, they really didn't even want staff coming in at all in May to make sure that our residents have every possible access to any parking options that we have. So that's a little bit of an extended piece for staff. Um, as, as far as we have right now, it's still planned for kind of the end of the year in December for staff to move back into the new refurbished government center East building, 
we will be up on the third floor instead of the first floor. Um, and I'm sure there'll, there'll be pictures and such at the time, but that's kind of the move. Uh, so that means all of our um, files, all of our reports, everything is boxed and in temporary storage. Uh, we didn't see a huge need to need access any of that this year. Um, much of it is electronic, uh, but obviously if there was something, um, we would probably have to postpone it. So uh, other than that, staff's working remotely on that. Um, one watershed, one plan. Uh, had the opportunity to speak at uh, chair vice chair and then at a board workshop uh, last week and uh, the board asked some very great questions. Um, in the end, they were very supportive of our efforts with one watershed, one plan and would like to move forward with that. Uh, they requested that we bring a resolution to the consent agenda in May. So we'll be doing that. Um, the one uh, interesting piece. I find it interesting. Probably most people don't find it interesting. Uh, as you remember, Commissioner Weaver and Commissioner Pint specifically, uh, the county can choose to have two, they have two votes for the policy committee for one watershed, one plan, because there is a seat for the WMO and there is a seat for the county specifically. And both agencies do specifically have to pass a resolution as to what um, level of participation they're going to follow. Uh, a lot of times what we've done is we just simply have one person represent both agencies. Uh, for example, as staff, I'm the one staff representing both agencies, I still get two votes. Um, in this case, uh, the board would like to see both of you there. Uh, each of you gets to represent an agency. However, you can obviously be the uh, backup for each other. Um, if you like, you could do rock, paper, scissors as to which one you get to represent. Um, <laughs> you know, you can discuss it too. We can discuss it obviously afterwards as well. And I'll meet with you to kind of review what those roles are. Um, and so there'll be more to follow on that. Um, again, the application for that planning grant is in June. So I will let the WPC know uh, where that goes and hopefully fingers crossed that we get it. It is a competitive grant. So if we don't get it, obviously we can go, we can apply again and we would obviously apply again, but fingers crossed um, that our team gets it. So uh, second update uh, is the Unified Watershed Management um, collaboration that we are doing with the Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District and the Soil and Water Conservation District. So that's the bigger uh, effort to kind of look at how watershed management is occurring in the metro. You, you remember we kind of talked about it a little bit at their last meeting, but that was, it was very new. We really didn't know much about it and the boards really hadn't had a chance to really discuss uh, the strategy, the goals. And so we're working through all of that right now. As of this point in time, um, there is no one path forward that anybody's agreed upon for sure. Everything's open to how we might manage the different watersheds um, and how we might manage watershed in the county. Um, some key things are that we have kind of an official steering committee now, which are two members of the county slash WMO board, two members of the Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District Board, and two members of the Soil and Water Conservation District Board. Uh, that are kind of help, helping to kind of steer this and lead it and then make decisions and bring them back to their boards. And then uh, there's also a, like a technical or project management team, which is made up of myself, Troy from the SWCD, uh, Joni Geese from, she's the administrator for Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District. So she replaced Diane. Uh, she's lovely. Um, <laughs> not that Troy, you're not lovely. Troy, you're lovely. Um, and then also uh, Brad, uh, they turned the camera back on, I like that. And then Brad from the county. So um, we're gonna start reaching out to also a larger group of technical representatives um, and uh, we'll bring that information back. So as information gets disseminated from the steering committee, I'll be bringing that back to you here at the WPC to kind of digest and comment on. So that's kind of the, the update I'm gonna give you right now. We're currently just kind of working on a, on a broader plan and goal packet. And so once we have that completed, 
um, I'll bring that back to you probably at the next meeting. So um, in addition to that, uh, I know we plan on doing a TAC to kind of understand the impacts of our actual water resources and the scientific impacts of water resource management at the, at the actual resource level. Uh, but since we're also going to be having to do a, a minor plan amendment this year, uh, to update our CIP, because frankly, we've done so many CIPs, we need to add more to the list, which is good. Uh, I thought we would just tie that together so that we could just have one TAC meeting um, and then cover multiple topics. Uh, and, and the TAC members tend to be really supportive of that, because obviously these are uh, professionals working for all of the different cities and townships, and, and um, we try to be really, really thoughtful of their time. So that's where that is. Um, the next piece is just a very brief, as you guys know, FEMA did update its maps. Uh, so we're working really hard on processing and answering a lot of those calls related to uh, what happens to me now that my property appears to now be in the floodplain. Uh, so I've been walking a lot of residents through uh, doing a LOMA or a LOMA RF map amendment if they have that option, um, what, what's kind of available to them and helping them connect with FEMA. FEMA's been excellent, really responsive to residents. That's been their, their feedback. Um, we're working really hard to help them also just kind of get their new maps. FEMA's got a great new map application uh, that they didn't have previously, uh, but uh, that call volume is really high right now. So we're doing a lot of those. <laughs> um, one other piece is that we will be doing a Scott County Delivers presentation in July. Uh, that will be available to watch or you can uh, um, I can see if I can get a recording of that as well. And I'll bring you those dates as they come closer. And then finally, I'm also on a committee from um, at Council and the Board of Water and Soil Resources to look at the more collaborative view of planning at the local level. I know it sounds like we're doing the same thing three times. There's a little difference between them. This one is very specifically looking at the plan requirements, like the comprehensive plans and the watershed management plans of uh, municipalities and watersheds. And is there opportunities and where are the opportunities to kind of streamline that and eliminate any duplication and overlap. Uh, so I've been participating in that. This month, there's going to be a meeting to kind of release some of their final findings. Uh, so once they have some final findings, I'll bring that back to you to look at as well. So. With that, I stand for any questions. Actually, I said I'm not going to stand, but I sit for any questions. Any questions for Vanessa? Okay, hearing none, um, I think we can move on to project updates from Ryan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good evening. Uh, just a few updates, uh, which we have kind of discussed in the past, but just uh, to get you up to speed at where we're at with things. So today, um, I actually met with our public works department on site. If you remember our phase one stream bank site had some erosion where one of the vertical logs snapped off. And today's visit was just to see if uh, the public works department could actually handle this uh, maintenance activity. Uh, access is a little bit tricky. Um, getting what we're proposing is uh, rock down there to kind of fill in this void on a, a structure. So we walked it today, um, kind of showed them a, a path that we could use, and they did not see uh, an issue with doing that. Um, we are getting so close to the planting season that it um, it just doesn't make sense to do the maintenance now. It would also cause some compaction for the renter um, that they won't be able to till the field before they plant it. So um, we're thinking fall at this point. Um, and so I'll confirm that with the landowner and the renter to make sure, but that will likely happen. I would think in November, December timeframe, um, once the crops come out. Um, if you remember, that's the site where our access is through a crop field. So we kind of have that window of time when the crops are not in the field uh, to kind of access it. So uh, we'll continue to work together on that. <clears throat> uh, we're also able to touch base on Quarry Creek. Had a couple um, areas that we're still kind of looking at. There was a, a inlet pipe to our weir structure. We just want to make sure that that is clear of sediment. If not, we'll have to uh, rent a piece of equipment that actually can push some of that sediment through it 
um, and, and out the other side. So we'll take a look at that in the spring, see how everything um, started to green up here as well. We did a little bit of the cleaning right in front of that weir structure in the fall. So just see how the seed, seed took. Um, and then also, uh, if you remember, there was a buffer that we had to replant due to some herbicide carryover that killed some trees and shrubs. So we've ordered our trees through the SWCD. Those are arriving this week. So um, once they arrive, we'll pick them up and put them in the ground. So um, that'll be all done by uh, this week, end of this week. We are also working with EPA and MPCA staff, or I guess MPCA staff on our EPA grant. And that one is coming to an end in August. And as we're approaching the end, uh, we want to make sure, and, and MPCA wants us as well, to make sure we utilize all these funds. So right now I'm going through just seeing if there's any slippage in various tasks that we have in the grant. I believe we do have some amount uh, probably in the neighborhood of five to 10,000. Uh, so very little uh, considering the grant was over half a million. But um, with that being said, we still want to get that to zero. So through a combination of um, updating our story maps, which would be staff time for the county, um, staff time for the SWCD as they have a number, uh, the Scott SWCD, as they have a number of projects that are being closed out this spring. Um, and then also uh, we did get word of a potential project in Lesueur County where the landowner receives some equip funds. Um, they're not getting a very good rate on it. It's a little bit lower. And so he was just kind of um, looking at other potential cost share sources. So um, I was working with the sewer SWC staff today on that project. So we're still kind of exploring that one. Um, if it can be constructed and certified complete before the end of the grant, there's some potential that we'll uh, put some dollars towards that project and, and get one more in the ground here before the, the grant ends. So um, we will we will make sure to get that uh, down to zero and uh, at the you know desire of both us and MPCA. We recently um, reached out to some of the cities in the county and um, other entities like the Parks Department. Uh, we've got a, a grant through Bowser, um, watershed-based funding grant, and one of the um, tasks in there was urban BMPs. And so that's why we were reaching out to the cities because uh, these practices need to relate to kind of um, mitigating uh, some, um, you know, development uh, stormwater features out there and in trying to go above and beyond what standards um, have been set for some of these projects. So for instance, if a parking lot was required to infiltrate an inch of water, um, if the city or contractor, you know, whoever we'd be working with is willing to go to two inches, say, or, you know, a, a higher amount than they have to, um, then this funding opportunity was a, a potential uh, for them to apply for. We did get uh, City of Shakopee came in with um, some uh, pretty good project. It's actually really close to the courthouse. Um, they're doing some street reconstruction um, and an uh, apartment building that they're constructing. And then also the city of Savage was looking to reconstruct a um, infiltration basin that they had, which is um, basically flows directly into Credit River. The Credit River is right on the other side of this pond. So they were both really good projects. Um, there is also uh, potentially one along Cedar Lake that we're looking at um, and that uh, those two landowners were working with the SWCD. Uh, on that. And then I know there's been some conversations too with the Cedar Lake Improvement District um, on potentially being involved in, in that as well. So um, we're working on, on that. Uh, we have to have them constructed and certified complete by this fall. The grant will end in December. So, you know, it doesn't give us a lot of time, but I think we, with all the different projects we have, we should utilize most, hopefully all of those funds. Um, and so we'll keep, we'll continue to keep working on those. Uh, last piece. So we started, <clears throat> or we're starting a macro invertebrate monitoring program this year. Um, first year that we've kind of done this. Uh, so we just ordered all our supplies. They'll be arriving 
Um, here in May, we should have everything. And then uh, after that, kind of uh, Vanessa and I will go out doing some monitoring. Um, the SCAD SWCD has graciously offered to allow us to tag along um, on uh, if they do some monitoring on Pika Creek. And that's because I don't have much experience. So Vanessa is helping me kind of get up to speed with this. Um, John Utek at the SCAD SWCD um, uh, is allowing me, if they do their monitoring, to tag along. Just kind of learn from him um, if they do that in August. And then also, um, Melissa connected me with Met Council, and they've got uh, some um, monitoring that they do. And so they've also offered to allow me to tag along, and, and that is also in August, too. So hopefully I'll know a little bit more about what I'm doing in August, um, but uh, it should be a kind of a fun program to, to start this year. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan? Okay. Oh, I lost my agenda. I had an open on another screen and one second, please. Oh, thank you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I had it open on another screen, but um, all right. Looks like we'll go to program updates uh, with Melissa. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, just a couple quick updates. Um, if you remember at the February meeting, I mentioned that the DNR had announced their AIS control grant again. Um, and it's a, it's a competitive grant and they were doing a, a random selection process. They didn't go into detail on how that random process worked, but I did get right on that. And I applied for all four lakes that we work on. So Cedar, McMahon, O'Dowd and Thowell. And we were awarded the control grant for three of the lakes. Um, so we were awarded for McMahon, O'Dowd, and Thole. McMahon was 2,475. O'Dowd was 3,247. And Thole was $2,250. Now, why they didn't just throw in Cedar Lake also, I don't know. <laughs> that would have been nice. but And all of the grants would have been no more than $5,000 anyway. But... Um, so we've already got those contracts executed. So we're ready to go whenever I can start working on the pretreatment surveys. Um, we're not getting any holdup from you know, the contract review process for those grants. Secondly, um, so for the last several years, um, when I would go out and do a aquatic plant survey, I would have to take paper forms and at every point, and I use a GPS, and at every point I'd have to write down all the data. Then I'd have to come back to the office or my desk and I'd have to re-enter in all this data into a spreadsheet to be able to you know, look at the data and create maps and send to the DNR and such. Well, finally this year, um, ARC map or our GIS has come out with a new tool. And so I've been working with our GIS department who has put together now this application for me that I can use right on my smartphone. Um, and it's, it's actually ArcGIS based. So when I'm out on the lake, um, my map shows up, I can turn on tracking. Um, and I just go to every point and we throw the rake and I can enter in all the data right on my phone. And then when I come back to the office, um, I can look at that all immediately on GIS. So it's all, you know, uploaded and I can create maps almost instantaneously. So I'm really excited about that new application. It's going to be really nice, really create a lot more efficiency for my time and to get reports done on a, on a quicker a time frame than what we have been dealing with. Um, typically, the DNR creates the report for each lake. Um, they take the data, create the maps, and then give us a draft report, but we don't get that until typically winter time. And, you know, it's been, we've been hoping that it was, you know, going to come out sooner, um, but they just don't have the staff to get it all done on time. So, um, so this should allow us to see the data, you know, a lot quicker and to make you know different plans hopefully um, on a more timely basis. 
Um, so I'm hoping that to get out at least this week, um, Wednesday looks like a low wind day to start the first survey. It's either gonna be on Thole or Cedar. It, I'm waiting to hear back from the DNR because actually on my calendar, um, the DNR wanted to do Cedar this week. Um, so hopefully on Wednesday, I'll get out and be able to try out the application and see if there's any um, thing that needs to be corrected on it. But um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. Um, lastly, um, on April 5th, I attended virtually a meeting with the Cedar Lake Improvement District. It's been a while since we've been um, able to connect and kind of get together and you know see who's doing what. And so that was interesting. It was a very good meeting. I appreciated their time. Um, they are, and I totally understand this, that they, they hired a contractor this year to do um, the pre-treatment survey and a post-treatment survey on Cedar Lake because of the fact that we don't get that data until you know the end of the year and we didn't even get the 2020 um, report yet from the DNR. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see um, what that contractor comes up with up with versus you know what our data shows as well. So it'll be kind of nice to have a comparison. Um, just kind of the extra check, but the WMO does intend to continue these surveys on all four lakes. Um, so, and hopefully with this new application, it'll make things a lot faster and have that data um, more readily available um, than having to wait till the end of the year. Um, it was also interesting to hear from them that they are um, contracting with WSB to do a CARP study um, and it sounds like it's similar to what the WMO did in 2017, which is a population of biomass study, but also sounds like um, they're gonna be looking for obstructions on the bottom of the lake. So for many years, the lid, um, the county started out um, trying to work with a commercial fisherman and then the lid kind of took it over, but um, We've had issues in the past trying to get a commercial fisherman on Cedar Lake because they've always said that they can't seen it because there's too many rocks or logs on the bottom of the lake and they don't want to damage their nets, which is understandable because those nets cost a lot of money. Um, so hopefully this study that they're going to do with WSB, you know, if they can look for those obstructions and see where they are and maybe move them or or confirm that there isn't anything to worry about, then maybe um, maybe it'll work out to commercial fishermen can come and stay in the lake uh, more often. But it'll also be good to have a check, you know, on the last population study that we had done, because it was with a different um, consultant. Um, we used CARP Solutions then, so so it was good to touch base with them and. Um, you know, with the Nine Elements um, grant, there is a task in there uh, that's that's for carp management um, that isn't in my work plan to start looking at until this fall, um, but we have four years to work on that. So um, we're thinking we can do something with, you know, this study that they're going to be doing and the carp management portion of that grant. And so uh, we'll update you as, as things move forward with that. So that's all I have at the moment. So I'm open to any questions if anybody has any. Questions for Melissa. Okay. I think we can move on then to the annual report and lake summary. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. So this year, um, uh, staff did work obviously very hard to complete our annual report and newsletter. Um, as you recall, it's an annual requirement for the WMO uh, that we must submit to Bowser to uh, kind of reflect back and show progress on how we are achieving our goals. And um, sorry, I just had a skip there. Uh, this is how we show progress towards achieving this RCIP and our work plan in our um, watershed management plan. So this is kind of the annual check that we submit to Bowser to kind of show how we are making that progress. So uh, the annual report is due to Bowser every year at the end of April. 
uh, because of just kind of the way finances and things work with the county. Uh, we kind of have kind of a scramble at the end to get it done, but we're always very successful and that is wonderful. So I am pleased to kind of bring this to you today. I'm just going to hit up kind of the three key points on the finance and the work plan. And then I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to kind of give you our annual lake summary, which is always kind of an everybody favorite. Uh, and then the rest of the report is there for you to kind of read and review. Uh, if you have any comments, you can certainly submit them today or any questions, you can submit them today. Uh, or you can obviously send them to me via email or call me uh, this week. I do intend to submit it though by the deadline on the 30th. So we only have a few more days. Uh, at the end though of today uh, for this meeting, we are as staff asking uh, the commissioners to recommend approval of the report in order to submit it to Bowser. So uh, the first thing I'm just going to discuss really briefly is to kind of review um, 2020's overall financial summary. So for 2020, uh, we get to use the words unprecedented a lot. I know we're all a little sick of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, unheard of, all of, the, all of the stuff that happened with COVID uh, last year. It's not really easy to, to sum up in you know, one short intro letter. Uh, but overall, it was very interesting because the work that we do uh, is very dependent upon an ecological system that is always changing. Uh, it's just kind of the nature of our work. Uh, and we don't tend to always know what's coming and we don't always have a good clear path as to how to manage it moving forward. So I think we were really well situated to be able to handle something like a pandemic. We would hope we would never have to, but we did. Um, so we were actually able to continue on a vast majority of our services uh, added to the fact that obviously a lot of our services, especially those contracted and done by the SWCD are done in the field with residents. So some of that outdoor work was certainly able to continue. Uh, we did uh, kind of tighten our belts and make sure that we were able to postpone or table things that we could uh, for a later date to, hold, to hopefully kind of save some of our funding and finances and we we're very successful with that. Uh, so uh, that being said, uh, as far as revenue for last year, uh, we did still take in our local water planning grant. Uh, in, interest income was down about 50%. Uh, property taxes came in about $5,000 short. Uh, PCA, the 319 grant came in um, a, about, well, a, quite a bit higher than it was anticipated, but whenever we talk about our grant funding coming in, uh, the year that it comes in fluctuates a little bit based upon reporting and when they disperse those pieces. So we always know the, the total dollar amount we're going to get in, but we're always kind of a little bit guessing from year to year exactly how much of that grant we'll get. So in this case, especially with the MPCA 2016-319 grant and the Sand Creek targeted grant, uh, we took in significantly more revenue for 2020 uh, than we had anticipated. Uh, there was a larger part of it that was anticipated to come in uh, in 2019 uh, that, that we ended up just ending up coming in in 2020. So it's still exactly what we're expecting to come into for the total of those grants. It's just what year it comes in is always a little bit of a, a guessing game. Uh, AIS funding again was $12,000 than expected. So uh, the total revenue for 2020 was one, basically $1.7 million. Um, it's about 84,000 more than we budgeted. Uh, and overall it kind of helped offset some of those shortcomings that we did not get in interest incomes and we do tend to get a little bit of miscellaneous um, income um, but this year turned last year turned out pretty well uh, so as well as revenue uh, expenses last year again as I said we tried to tighten our belts as much as we could um, that being said you know we had an extremely high year for tax projects uh, we were very successful for a lot of the work that we had planned for the year, um, but by tightening our belt where we could, we were definitely able to come in uh, far less than anticipated. So if you remember the 2020 budget, 
Uh, it was total expenses were anticipated closer to 1.6 million. Uh, we came in at about 1.3. So um, overall, you know, it turns out to be about $468,000 difference. Uh, administration, for example, we were able to save about uh, $40,000. Um, land and water treatment came in uh, just a little under budget, not much. Monitoring and data collection, uh, we did tend to table a bit of that. Education and public outreach, uh, obviously outdoor education days, you know, some of those things we weren't able to do. Uh, that was one of the ones. Regulation was pretty high. Uh, for those of you who've been paying attention, building and development was busy during the pandemic. So we'll remember that in future years. People don't stop building or developing. Um, I know just like everybody else, I looked outside at my yard and I was like, oh man, I could do that this year. <laughs> I think people have time to just sit and look. Um, Planning and coordination were obviously higher. So a lot of agencies and partners that, you know, were working on things like One Watershed, One Plan. Uh, we pushed those a little harder last year to kind of offset some of the projects that maybe they weren't able to put in the ground. Um, so again, that being said, PCA grants came in, watershed-based funding grants came in, and the Cyan Creek targeted grant also came in. So um, it did help bump our fund budget, fund balance up to about just shy of uh, $500,000, which is putting us much closer to that 30 to 35% range that we'd like to be in, because uh, we've been sitting in the 20% range uh, for the last few years, uh, largely due to trying to invest as much as we could into meeting the match for the original Sand Creek grant. So uh, we are where we should be. Um, in fact, we're a little better off. We tightened it up as much as we could and it helped. So for 2020, um, one, uh, you folks have already obviously seen that budget and approved that, so I'll let you look at that later. Um, but again, just kind of a program by program assessment for 2020, as I said, uh, we completed or we're continued to do a lot of work in a lot of areas. Uh, inventory and assessment, um, we, are, we are working with the city of Prior Lake to complete that Pika Creek Headwaters assessment. Uh, Prior Lake is actually heading that, which is great. Um, finishing the Cleary Lake subwatershed assessment and beginning the Roberts Creek subwatershed assessment, as Troy mentioned, uh, that was done. Um, complete subwatershed assessments for Thoal and upstream, so that was one that was tabled. Um, and then again, we did work to try to support the cities of Savage and Shakopee with their studies. Uh, for education, again, uh, we definitely were very successful with the um, with our sweat partners and many kudos to the SWCD for being able to pivot uh, another one of those great COVID words on uh, getting a lot of webinars in place of um, in person uh, and they were very heavily attended. It was, it was wonderful. Um, so that was still very successful even while outdoor education days and our youth outreach uh, kind of got waylaid. Um, we were still very successful at the success stories. And again, uh, Schwepp does have an annual report for you guys to read as well. We just include a small summary in our annual report. So I always encourage you to read that. Uh, again, something that was kind of a bit tabled last year was maintaining the Sand Creek story maps, but we're picking that up again this year. Um, and obviously some of that social-based uh, community marketing options. Uh, land and water treatment as again it was one of the highest years we've seen again with the tax program um, we move forward again with the tmdls for cedar and mcmahon um, we uh, were out there um, getting out there with working on our partnerships to get funding and we were all very successful with mcmahon funding and our mark lee team is also working and being pretty successful with that so monitoring, uh, high kudos to uh, Melissa for last year. One of the first agencies out on the water getting boat inspections done before the DNR, before almost anybody else. So uh, she worked really hard and considering how much uh, traffic we had on our, our boat, on our lakes, um, it was very helpful. So uh, we were lucky we were out there by like 4th of July weekend, right, Melissa, if I remember correctly, yeah. That was a big date. Uh, so again, and a lot of that was because we already had operations plans in place. So the county had a really strong initiative from the beginning to come up with an operation plan as to how we implement the work that we do 
without significant loss of service during a pandemic. So because we had to create that plan from the get-go very early on in the pandemic, we were really ready to go and pull the trigger when we could start implementing these things. So we did end up helping a lot of other agencies that reached out to us to understand how are you doing your work? Um, so in that, I will say we have a very, very excellent staff. So Ryan, Melissa, you guys get a lot, um, a lot of, well, I can't pat you on the back, but I would if I could. <laughs> Um, for all that amazing hard work, uh, Troy and all the staff at the SWCD, phenomenal work. Uh, nobody stopped or slowed down. Everybody just dug in and, and kept moving. So uh, regulation, again, was very high. Um, review of updated of local water plans. Melissa did a lot of that last year as well. Um, but in addition, just the general regulation for permitting was very high. Um, I kind of talked about, again, how successful we were with the planning and the coordination. Um, and page on to maintenance, Ryan, if you could, please. Um, and then again, um, Ryan's gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, one of the bigger pieces with maintenance again was the development of the PMP inspection app, which he'll be talking about later on. And um, one of the things that was tabled was an asset management program, uh, which we might pick up again with the county if they decide to move forward with that. So uh, this year, uh, we've talked about many of the things that we do plan on doing this year, but just a quick reminder, um, we're gonna continue that partnership with Prior Lake on the Pika Creek Headwaters study. So for the city of Prior Lake, uh, they wanna get ahead of development and kind of start identifying the best way to manage stormwater runoff. So it's not an issue there. And so they can kind of help direct and guide development rather than have to just react to it. Um, so it's a really beneficial study to all the partners. Um, I've talked about a couple of those other things. Uh, Schwepp obviously is gonna go rearing forward again this year. We were able to get again, a watershed-based implementation funding grant to help bolster Schwepp. And if um, it would also help support some of those more technical outreach opportunities and reaching more of our residents that way too and enhancements. Land and water treatment, we have a couple of really big grants. Ryan has been a rock star in getting those grants implemented <laughs> and working with Board of Water and Soil Resources, really getting those contracts going and um, just, it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of back and forth, um, a lot of emails back and forth. So um, we'll continue again to work on our partnership activities with McMahon. As Melissa has mentioned, we do expect to hear from the DNR in about June, um, hopefully with that grant agreement so that we can really jump into McMahon. And then monitoring, you know, Ryan's kind of talked about that. Um, and again, um, our macroinvertebrate monitoring program we're going to launch this year. For my perspective, bacterial uh, bacterial monitoring and macroinvertebrate monitoring are two other key tools to have. Uh, water quality monitoring is great for giving you a point of, of data for how a water body is doing, but uh, macroinvertebrate monitoring gives you a better idea of how healthy a water body is over a larger period of time um, and it can also be used for identifying whether or not a water body is meeting its designated use. So you have to have the program and you got to have the monitoring to back that up though. Um, so again we've talked a lot about the planning and coordinating activities uh, so I'm just gonna you know glaze over those as I've already kind of provided you updated with those. Um, but um, again we're going to continue those maintenance efforts as needed. Um, Brian will be talking with you really quick here uh, regarding a BMP inspection application. So um, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Melissa so she can talk to you about what we all actually came for, which is how are our lakes doing? And then we are here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, Brian, can you just bring it? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show that. So I just wanted to remind um, all of you. Um, so this box here at the top. So Scott County falls within um, the eco region of the North Central Hardwood Forest. So there's several different eco regions um, and water quality standards are created for each different eco region. And so 
I like to keep this box included at the top as a reminder of what those standards are. So for total phosphorus in shallow lakes, the water quality standard is 60 micrograms per liter or 60 parts per billion. So any if it falls under that, then it's meeting water quality standards. If it's measuring above that, then it's not meeting that water quality standard. Chlorophyll A is 20 parts per billion. And then transparency or the Secchi disc reading um, should be greater than one meter. Um, so if we can scroll up just a little bit so we can see both charts, thank you. Um, so for Cedar Lake, you know, we've got quite a bit of data now on Cedar Lake from 2006 to 2020 on this chart. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple things that I've seen here. So the purple line is total phosphorus. The green line is chlorophyll A. Um, and the lighter blue color is clear water. So that's where um, light can light can shine through. Um, but when we hit this darker blue area, that's where um, that's more murky water where light light is not being able to penetrate through the water column anymore. And that's kind of where that sucky disc you can't see anymore is at that point. So um, what's interesting is that if you look at cedar, so the sucky disc transparency is pretty low. It's about 0.7 meters. So it's less than that one meter. And when we look down at McMahon for 2020, you can see that the clarity decreased um, in 2020 as well. So it, so it kind of stayed about the same in 2019 and 2020 on Cedar, but it was, wasn't good. Um, and in 2020, the clarity decreased in McMahon also. And what's interesting for both of those lakes is that total phosphorus kind of stayed the same but chlorophyll A was reduced. So I just found that interesting that both of those lakes kind of had the same um, measurement um, reaction in 2020. Um, so if we scroll down one more page and look at O'Dowd and Thole as a comparison, what, I, what, what you can notice that's interesting is um, looking at 2019 to 2020 on the O'Dowd chart is clarity did decrease a little bit. So tr the transparency was decreased on O'Dowd. And also on Thole on the bottom, that darker blue area, transparency de decreased as well. My thought on that overall is that there was so much more boat action on the lakes that there was a lot more stirring up of um, the water and that probably decreased clarity some on all four lakes. But what's interesting on O'Dowd and Thole is that total phosphorus went up um, and it went up on Thole also, but not so much on O'Dowd, but, but Thole is a lot shallower than, than the other lakes, um, especially in the bays and the, in the kind of more open area, it's probably about the same as I would say most areas in Cedar, but um, so I just found that interesting that the clarity on all four lakes pretty much decreased, um, but Cedar and McMahon kind of had the same reaction with total phosphorus and chlorophyll A, and then O'Dowd and Thold kind of increased. Um, now O'Dowd has that, that Southern Bay that's really shallow also. So if there's a lot of boat action down there that really gets churned up as well. Um, but these readings are taken from, typically from the deepest part of the lake. So um, with O'Dowd, I mean, it's still for the most part meeting water quality standards. Um, I should add a line on here as to where that water quality standard is, but it's kind of hard with showing um, all three parameters on here, but so I don't really see, just looking at this chart, I don't really see evidence that this year was a huge change in water quality for O'Dowd, um, especially since you know chlorophyll A hasn't really increased, but um, I definitely think that there was a trend on all four lakes with 
clarity decreasing and that could be due to the additional boat activity um, that we saw across the state. So um, I guess at this point, I'll just see if anybody has any questions on any one of the lakes. I will also say, I do have to add that the 2020 data is missing two months of water quality samples. So um, because of um, everything last year and we're trying to figure out how to operate safely, uh, Met Council, I typically get supplies from them every year to restock the kits for all of our camp volunteers. And I wasn't able to get those supplies from Met Council until June. So I didn't drop off the kits until June and they typically start sampling all the lakes in April. So we're missing two months that should be worked into that average. Um, so maybe if we had April and May, that some of these results might look a little different because we'd have a different average, but um, yeah, it's hard to say. So does anyone have any questions at this point on the lakes? No, this is Commissioner Pint. Uh, after uh, careful reviewing the uh, annual report and lake summary, uh, I'd like the Planning Commission to recommend to the WMO the approval of the report as published. Um, do we have, did you guys have anything else that you wanted to go over with the report? Well, that was it, okay. Um, thank you for your um, motion, uh, Commissioner Pint. Do we have a second to approve the report as presented? Commissioner Shea, I'll, I'll second. Yep. Thank you, I will do a roll. Uh, Commissioner Weaver? Aye. Commissioner Thill? Aye. Commissioner Shea? Aye. Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Commissioner Casilius? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. Commissioner Pitt? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. Um, and, and Madam Chair, I, I realize that you do need to leave here soon. So if you need to transfer um, the meeting over to uh, Commissioner Pitt, you could do so at this time if that would be what you would like to do. Thank you. Yes, I was going to mention that, that I do have to jump off. So and I apologize. Um, so if Commissioner Pint, if you'd be willing to take over for me, um, I would appreciate it. I'd be happy to do that for you, Rita. Take care. All right. So moving on to the next item in the agenda, it looks like it's the uh, watercraft inspection contract with MBE. Who on staff wants to address that? Thank you, Commissioner Pint. Um, so for the past two years, we've experimented with hiring a vendor to do watercraft inspections for us on Cedar McMahon, O'Dowd and Thole. And we've been very pleased with them. Um, they came highly recommended. Their, their name is Waterfront Restorations. Um, but we have decided that it would be a lot easier to do a multi-year contract. So because a multi-year contract was be, gonna be a lot more money. I decided I needed to go out for a request for proposals. So there's really only two companies that state that this is one of their main services. So I sent a RFP to Water Guards and to Waterfront Restorations. Um, in that request for proposals, there's very specific things that we ask for and um, I did get a call from both companies and they asked a couple questions and I did um, remind them, I said, please make sure you read everything carefully and put everything in your proposal that it asked for in the RFP. So they submitted proposals on time. When I reviewed them, um, one company was missing three things that I asked for in the RFP in their proposal. Um, so with water guards there, um, the cost in the proposal was to charge $22 an hour over the three year period. 
um, for inspections and waterfront was $23.94, so $1.94 more per hour. Um, but water guards did not completely fulfill everything that we asked for and waterfront did. So even though waterfront was a little bit more expensive, um, they were more responsive. And they actually include things that WaterGuard does not, that WaterGuard would charge additional for. Um, so after review, staff would recommend that we go with waterfront restorations again. And I just, I can go over some, what some of the differences are um, so water guards would charge us extra for the DNR training of their inspectors, whereas waterfront includes that in the cost. Um, water guards won't do it. I mean, they'll do an end of year report, but it's only like a one or two page report, whereas waterfront gives us basically anything we want. We can ask them for all different kinds of parameters and charts and graphs, and they will create it for us. So we get a much more robust report from them. Um, I did check one of the references from water guards and their inspectors were not able to ID certain plants that were found on watercraft, whereas Waterfront does do extra training for their inspectors for that. So they are able to identify um, AIS. Water guards would charge extra for to do a presentation um, to say this group if we wanted them to, whereas Waterfront just includes that in their price. And, um, and also Waterfront again gives additional training beyond the DNR training um, to their inspectors. And they also would give me access to their online tracking system for their inspectors so that they're it's a GPS online tracking system, so I can get a login to see where they are, you know, if I wanted to check in on them or whatever, but they check in on them for us also. So, so this would be a three-year contract this year, 2022 and 2023, um, for up to 1,400 hours of inspection hours on five different accesses. So two on Cedar, McMahon, O'Dowd, and Thole. Um, and the contract maximum would not exceed $100,548. So staff recommends that because of the extra um, things that we get with waterfront restorations that we would um, ask for a recommendation to go with waterfront for the three-year contract. Um, and I do have a draft contract uploaded to the contract site um, that's waiting for review. Um, and so this will also be going to the county board next month as well for approval. So with that, I'll stand for it. Oh, I just wanted to do one more thing is that actually last year, I think Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District actually had their inspectors out earlier than we did <laughs> because, the, because they went with water guards and um, I think they were out a lot earlier, like in May. Than we were right, I just remembered that too. I think yeah. you said it too. I was thinking about it. Oh, that's right. They did get a, they did definitely a little bit before, uh, but we were really high up there in the, in the state. In the <laughs> so, so okay. with that, I'll stand for any questions or a recommendation for um, approval to move forward with uh, waterfront restorations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for a good presentation. Uh, any commissioners have any questions or follow up for Melissa? Um, if we don't hear of any, then we'd be open to entertain a motion to recommend the three year contract for the waterfront restoration. Are you hearing no questions? Go ahead, sorry. Commissioner Shea? Okay, yeah. No, this is Commissioner Shea. Yeah, I would make a motion to recommend the uh, to to approve the three year um, watercraft inspection agreement or contract agreement with the uh, waterfront restoration. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Casilius. I'll second it. Okay, there's been a, a motion uh, been and seconded 
to recommend to the board the three-year contract with waterfront restoration. Uh, we can have a roll call, please. Absolutely, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Thill. Aye. Commissioner Shea. Aye. Commissioner Veerling. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. And Commissioner Pint. Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. All right, Ryan, looks like you're next on the agenda with the tax free project update. So Mr. Chair, uh, this was the item that we removed off of the agenda. Uh, what it was was a duplication or a placeholder spot for the tax projects that are sure. um, the last and second to last items. Okay, so we move on to the next item then, the, the BMP uh, ins uh, inspection application contract. Mr. Chair, that is correct. So, um, as Vanessa was discussing during the annual report, we have set up a contract with uh, Wink, who was recently just acquired by Stantec. Um, so they're just two consulting firms that, that joined together. Um, and this program is intended to track our status review of inspections on our capital improvement projects. Um, it, it could track other projects as well, but we've essentially set it up just for the, all the CIPs that um, we've been more recently constructing. So this application um, would be a GIS based application. So um, using our current ArcMap uh, license and setting up that application there. And, and there's a number of different things things that we have as GIS products, um, like our story maps, that's a, a GIS application as well. Um, and so we've been having some meetings with Wink along the way. We just did our kickoff meeting um, last week. And so we hope to actually have this product done by uh, July-ish timeframe. Um, and what it will do is we'll enter in all our current CIPs that we have. You know, they'll go into this database and we can uh, pull up this application when we're in the office on the computer, um, look up any past inspections. So let's say you were planning on going out to the field uh, on a certain day, you can go back and look to see what was the status of this project at the last inspection. Was there an area of concern? Um, did it have some work done on it or was it looking good? Um, so it, it would be beneficial for the inspector to kind of know that information. Um, everything's being housed in one spot. So currently our system is, uh, we had uh, some files electronically on our um, database uh, scoop. And then also there are hard copy files in the project folder. So they're all in different spots. Um, this is a way to house them all together. So we're setting it up to have kind of two inspections, just a routine inspection. And then if we have some maintenance to um, each time we go out there to kind of log what, what it is, is, is it changing? Um, and eventually um, you're doing, completing the maintenance and then kind of having those maintenance records sort of in the background um, as, as we, um, you know, correct things that way, you know, we can kind of see where, where things are at and not kind of um, bog it down by just a, a lot of different forms or inspection notes on there. Um, so that's kind of the, the gist of the program. And another really neat feature that we decided to add is this program has the ability to, once you're out in the field, you would have like a mobile application, like a tablet or your phone. And so an inspector that's not familiar with a site, let's say first time ever being out there, they might not necessarily know where they're at on the site. And so we can actually upload our design plans and have them spatially referenced in the application. And what that means is we have sort of like a dot that represents us, you know, the inspector that's out there. And as you walk around the site, that dot will move as well and you'll see it. So if it's, you know, we're looking at a, a weir structure or a pipe, we should be able to tell then on the actual design set plan, this is the exact pipe we're looking at. This is the structure or where on that structure are you currently standing? So if you wanted to note, 
you know, it's this portion of it, or, you know, it's not the whole project that needs anything maintained. It, it could just be one area of it. Um, we'd be able to very specifically note that. And we can take photos that also get spatially referenced in there either. So you know wh what angle you took a photo from or where were you standing when you took that photo. Um, and, and this should be beneficial for one internally that we have this new record-based um, system that we can easily pull records from. You know, a lot of these projects are funded through grants. And so if anybody wanted to ask for those inspection records and, and take a peek at them, if they help fund the project, we can easily do that. Um, also, like we're currently experiencing, you know, some of these projects need maintenance to them. This is a good way where we could potentially take photographs, um, maybe save a trip out there, you know, for, um, actually going out to look at it. You know, we might be able to, with enough of this data, just send an email with photos and, you know, show them where on a design plan the work needs to be done. And maybe it saves time in that regard. Or if we're going outside of the county to do any work, you know, typically we try to use the public works department first if they can handle it. And then if, if not, um, then we look at a consultant. And then once again, this would be an easy way to kind of Get them all the, the nuts and bolts of what exactly needs to be done out there. Um, and so you know, we're very excited about it. Um, and, you know, I'll, I guess at that point, I'll kind of stand for any questions if anybody has any. Okay. Th thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, commissioners, uh, questions for Ryan. As we're waiting for that, Ryan, I just have a couple quick questions. One is, yeah. um, um, there is budget money for this. Um, it, you don't mention anything about that. And second of all, then, uh, is this primarily a tool to give you more efficiency, uh, so time saving, or uh, give you a more uh, higher quality of service? Mr. Chair, uh, really good question. So, first one, yes, we do have this budgeted. Um, it's in our maintenance uh, portion for the 2021 budget. So we have kind of planned accordingly to have the funds available for it this year. And the second part, um, I would say it, it's probably both um, efficiency. It, it will certainly save um, time. Um, you know, Melissa was kind of describing her GIS application she's working on and, and how that kind of saves time. Um, you know, now it's, it's kind of logging the information out in the field, writing it down on paper, bringing it back, logging it. Whereas this, you can easily, we're gonna set it up where it's mostly just drop downs, and then there will be a note section because every site visit's gonna be different, but we should be able to log it in real time when we're on site, don't have to come back to upload anything or, or do anything else. It, it should all be um, in there. So it, it'll definitely save time um, in that manner. And I think the way that it's set up where these templates can be produced, um, it would be a, a very, easy way to show you know the pictures and the captions associated with them, the, the report itself so it's going to auto generate those for us um, so I, I think also the, the quality of the product is going to be much better as well Good. well th thank you ryan it helps um, any other questions by commissioners if not we'd be open to entertain a motion to mm -hmm. recommend the approval This is Commissioner Casilia. So I'll uh, make a motion to approve the status review tracking program. Commissioner Casilia uh, made the motion to recommend the uh, to the board the approval of this. Is there a second to this motion? This is Commissioner Thill. I'll approve. I'll make the second. Thank you, Commissioner Thill. There has been a motion and a second. Uh, may we take a roll call vote? Absolutely. Commissioner Phil? Aye. Commissioner Shea? Aye. Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Commissioner Casilius? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. And Commissioner Pitt? Aye. And I'd, I'd add that uh, we can bring this to the commissioners and kind of walk you through it once it's up and running. It's They're fun to look at, so. <laughs> That'd be appreciated. Great, thank you. Yep. Brian, looks like we have the uh, Sean O'Malley uh, Stream Bank Stabilization Amendment on the agenda next. 
Sure, commissioners. Yes. So this name may ring a bell. Um, we had reviewed this uh, particular project um, late in 2020. So um, the reason why it is back here today is at that time, we did not have um, very much funds as 2020 was coming to an end. If you remember, we were running very low on our cost share dollars. And uh, we had one particular grant that this project was eligible for, but all we had was $1,813. And so that's what it was approved at. It represented, I believe, 18% of what the original cost estimate was. Uh, so very low. Um, uh, landowners are eligible for 50% um, on stream bank projects. And so this landowner at that time with, with only those available funds did take that um, and it was approved at that point. Uh, due to uh, this project being uh, on Credit River, it's a DNR protected water, there was language in the permit that um, was needed for the project that stipulated when it could be constructed. So originally it was gonna be constructed in the winter. However, the DNR requires these type of projects to be constructed in the summer. So this particular landowner has reached out um, and was exploring the idea of amending their current contract. Um, now that we do have additional dollars for 2021 to bring Kosher up to what they would be eligible for. Um, but because of our limited funding last year, they, um, they just didn't have the opportunity to receive the full amount that they were eligible for. So, this would be an increase um, to the contract, an increase of $3,202 uh, to bring it to a total of $5,015, which represents half of the project cost. Um, and we do have the funds to cover this in our local general fund for 2021. Um, we, we've got you know, a decent amount of cost share with our grants that, are, um, that have kind of become available here more recently. Uh, the reason why it is back here is that all stream bank stabilizations are a um, WPC uh, route application. And so they go to the SWCD first for a recommendation, which they did approve um, at their April 20th board meeting. And then the next uh, stop would be the WPC for a recommendation. Um, one thing to note, uh, maybe you did notice this, there is a slight typo uh, on the actual amendment itself. Uh, the technical representative has cleaned that up. They got the landowner to sign it. So, um, and I just received it today uh, with it being such a minor thing, I, I didn't um, add it. But so this does say 3,202 on the amendment that will be uh, potentially signed if this is approved. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ryan. Any commissioners have any questions for Ryan on this project? Hearing no questions, then uh, we would be open to a motion to recommend to the WMO board the approval of this uh, application. This commissioner Shea, I'll uh, make a motion to approve the additional 3,202 amendment to the application. There's been a motion to recommend it. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Thiel, I'll second that. There's been a motion and it's been seconded to recommend the approval. May we have a roll call vote? Absolutely. Commissioner Thiel? Aye. Commissioner Shea? Aye. Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Commissioner Casilius? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. And Commissioner Pint? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Finally, moving to the last item on the agenda, it's the uh, Joe and Marge Larson shoreline protection application, Ryan. Sure, Commissioner. So um, here we've got another application for your review. Um, as the chair just stated, uh, this is for Joe and Marge Larson. Um, they are on Cedar Lake. And what ended up happening with this project is there was a, a large willow tree on the shoreline um, that, that uh, did come down. And um, what it's doing is it's kind of undermining the shoreline um, at the Larson site and it is experiencing erosion. 
Um, and with that, without the protection of that willow there too, it, it is now experiencing some wave action um, where it's um, kind of having that continuous uh, erosion that's occurring. Um, and so uh, the project is proposing to remove that willow tree, regrading the bank um, and selling a clear log to stabilize the toe. Um, and then uh, having kind of an upland uh, buffer to it as well. So in the end, this project would protect 30 feet along Cedar Lake uh, from nutrients and sediments from entering the lake. Uh, the estimated cost of the project is $3,990 and the proposed amount from the WMO is $2,793. Um, and then the landowners themselves would be kicking in the rest, which is $1,197. Uh, this project would uh, come out of the 2021 local general fund, uh, which we do have sufficient funds for the project. And this project, um, is that particular practice requires a screening committee uh, recommendation. So the SWCD did review this at their April 20th board meeting and recommended approval and it is here today for the WPC's um, action on it. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan on this project? This is Commissioner Casilius. I do have one kind of dotted line, <laughs> maybe connection to this, and that is on the north end of Cedar Lake. Um, it, 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 sort of uh, like on the north end. So if I'm standing looking at the lake, it would be to the west side. There was a really large um, willow tree that went down uh, over the winter. And it, it looks like it was rotted in the middle, but but a huge tree fell over. It split up in half and, and it's still blooming, but it, it does that just have to remain in the lake? I don't even know if it's actually technically on anybody's property. It's kind of near to the, where the, the water outlet is, but I, I'm just curious if this wouldn't un, unfortunately maybe turn into a similar situation. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Cecilius, so I am not aware of any entity that would be required to remove it. Um, I guess who's ever property or if it's in a right of way potentially, um, they, they could. Um, we've got language in our ordinance that if it's a, a diseased or dead tree, uh, I don't know, I'd have to check on whether if it's you know, if it looks like it's going to be imminent, you know, that it eventually would die, if that would qualify or not for that. But um, there, there is some protection on cutting live trees um, within the shoreland uh, area. It's, it's not surprising that the willow's hanging on, even though it might be only half there. Yeah, I mean, it's me. I don't think this one's going to bounce back anytime soon, but potentially, at least for this season, it's still, you know, it's still turning green, but I, it just sort of, now it just creates kind of a, a big obstruction in the lake, but it, I just was curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, unless maybe Vanessa or Melissa has any other information, I, I'm not aware of that it would be required um, to be removed, but but certainly mm -hmm. the donor could, could explore that opportunity. Yeah, and Commissioner Casillas, that's a great question. I'm gonna let Melissa jump in here. Um, I know some things, but I, I think she's got a good answer. Um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> this before. <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's any requirement to remove it, but if it does cause a safety issue, the water patrol, the sheriff's water patrol, might have some funds to be able to do something about it. Otherwise they would mark it. Um, but I don't know of any um, case where the DNR has actually removed it from the lake. Unless Vanessa, you know. Uh, no, you're, you're both right. Unless it's causing an actual obstruction to the outlet, you know, causing flooding to that extent. Mm -hmm. um, it, or it has to be a, a significant obstruction to like boat safety or traffic. And as Melissa said, they tend to opt to mark it versus anything else. Um, again, yeah. it's a great question. Uh, DNR tends to see it as an opportunity for habitat um, in that kind of emergent zone. So um, still that being said, uh, private property owners do have the opportunity to uh, do other things. Like if you, if you wanna be able to do what these folks wanna do, you can do that. So if the private property owner um, and you probably have a little bit better grasp of, of who the owner might be. Um, wanted to, they can certainly reach out to us. Um, 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank. Thank you for letting me kind of, you know, have a sidebar. But that that was helpful. Oh, that's great. Question. Okay, we're looking for a commissioner to recommend the uh, recommend to the board the approval of this project. This is Commissioner Beerling will make a motion to approve the Larson Shoreline Protection application. There's been a motion to recommend the approval. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Phil. I'll second it. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Phil. Aye. Commissioner Shea. Aye. Commissioner Fearling. Aye. Commissioner Casilius. <laughs> Commissioner Casilius. Aye. Sorry, wrong button. It's okay. <laughs> Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. And Commissioner Pint. Aye. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments at this point? We're we'll done with the agenda. If I don't hear anything else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. And this is the, chair will, the chair will second that. So we can have a roll call vote. Commissioner Phil? Aye. Commissioner Shea? Aye. Commissioner Veerling? Aye. Commissioner Casilius? Aye. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye. And Commissioner Pence? Aye. Thank you so much, Commissioners. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good yeah, night. Have a great night, guys. And then, Ryan, you can stop recording at your convenience. So I'm clicking the stop button and it is not stopping. Try well, the Alt C button. Let's see if that does it. Well, no, still, still. How about we do on? this?